Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chloe Legendre. I'm a software engineer uh, at Google. I'm based in Los Angeles, and I'm gonna be talking about a research and engineering project that's called Deep Light, and I'm presenting today on behalf of a larger uh, software engineering team um, in, in Google. We're part of Google Daydream, which is the AR and VR division, specifically. Um, there's some other folks from Google that are gonna be speaking as part of this conference. Uh, they're representing Google Cloud, and so I think it's uh, worthwhile for us to think about positioning this as a case study on the kinds of things that you can do with distributed computing within Google's framework. So we're gonna talk about machine learning today, and this is an example of a kind of project that was done with machine learning using Google's distributed compute capability. I'm gonna be talking about how do you bring high quality lighting like you would see used in visual effects to real time mobile augmented reality. Um, we don't have any, very little, we have very little information in the scene when we're in AR. Uh, we don't have the ability to go around and actually measure the light in the scene, so we're gonna talk about how to use machine learning for this instead. So everyone in the room is familiar with augmented reality. We can think of this as any attempt to blend virtual rendered content with real world imagery, whether we're using a mobile phone or some kind of augmented reality headset. Um, like the HoloLens or something like that, for instance. So this is an example on the screen of Niantic's Pokemon Go. Um, here we've got the virtual rendered content as the Pikachu. The real world imagery is the live camera feed from my cell phone. Now, this might seem like a toy example because it's just Pokemon, but Pokemon has, I think, over 800 million downloads to date. And I just looked on uh, Wikipedia right before we started, and they've made over th uh, $3 billion. So just for frame of reference. So I'm an avid Pokemon Go player myself. Um, I've captured these two screen recordings here. One's outside um, in partial shade, a little bit of sun. One of them is indoors in this kind of very orangey lighting. And despite the fact that the Pokemon, the Pikachu here, is in these very different scenes, both of them are lit in completely different ways, or in, in completely like the same way, rather. So you can see they're in two different scenes, but the lighting on them looks pretty much the same. And we're gonna try to fix this. So here's some other examples. Um, and this kind of gives us a picture of the state of AR lighting today. So this is two shots here. Um, both of them have a window here in the scene, which is the dominant light source. Um, there's a strong light coming from the window, but if you look at the actual shading on the Pikachu, as well as the shadow underneath, it just looks like there's a single light source that's coming from above, which doesn't really make sense for this particular scene. Now, if we compare this with the state of the art and visual effects, this is a shot from the 2019 film Detective Pikachu. Here we've got the same character, same lighting. This is just a window coming from the right. But this time we can see that the uh, right side of the face of the Pikachu is brightly lit. The left side is in shadow. And we even see realistic reflections in the Pikachu's eyes. And this is what we've come to expect from high quality visual effects. So most VFX shots like this one that involve rendering synthetic objects into real world scenes they rely on a record of lighting that's been photographed from the real world. Um, this technique was developed um, at SIGGRAPH in 98, um, where Paul DeBevic introduced a lighting measurement and rendering technique that would enable realistic composites blending both real and virtual imagery, like you can see in this shot. Now, because an object's appearance in an image is the result of light that arrives from a full sphere of lighting directions around it, um, the technique that was used to measure the lighting uh, typically involved panoramic high dynamic range photography. Um, this was achieved in practice by photographing a mirror ball that reflects light from all directions using multiple exposures and then radiometrically aligning the different shots. Now for those who have experienced working in visual effects in the room, you've probably seen someone on the VFX team walking around with their mirror ball. This is why they're trying to actually capture the lighting in the scene. So these multiple exposures are required because light in the real world can be, is high dynamic range. Light sources can be orders of magnitude brighter than the rest of the scene. So at the same time in this work, this is images of an object that's rendered with high dynamic range lighting here on the left, comparing with single image lighting. If you don't shoot those multiple exposures here on the right, it's clearly wrong. And it still looks long, wrong if you just brighten the lighting up. Um, but if you can capture this 360 imagery in HDR by photographing your mirror sphere, then you can very convincingly render synthetic objects into a real world scene. So here we've got different objects um, that are being lit by several different photographed lighting environments. Now, because these photographs came to represent the illumination, this technique came to be referred to as image-based lighting, and it works well 
as I said before, it's used in most modern VFX-based films. But there's one big drawback here, which is that it requires uh, photographing your real-world lighting well in advance of rendering. So with this in mind, we can see that this is going to be totally impractical for mobile AR. We can't expect casual mobile phone users to go around photographing mirror balls with their phone <laughs> before their AR session. Maybe me. I'm, I'm the one doing that there. But nobody else is going to do that. Um, so let's take a look then instead at what information we actually do have available to us in an AR session. We can assume that, at a minimum, we're going to have access to the live camera feed. Uh, so this is an example shot um, near our office in Playa Vista. This is just a grassy path near the Google campus. Now, if we look at the paired 360 environment, shown here as a panorama, we can see that our cell phone camera, with its very limited field of view, is actually only going to see about 6% of the lighting directions in the scene. And they're not even the most useful lighting directions, because we would have wished we'd seen like, the light direction where the sun is coming from, for instance, in this shot. And so that means that in the absence of photographing that mirror ball, which is equivalent to the panorama, we're talking about having to hallucinate 94% of the scene. And that's where the machine learning comes in, because we are really effectively having to hallucinate here. Um, now, the other thing is that our live camera feed is just a single exposure. It's a, usually just a, an image that's compressed into an 8-bit range. And that means that even if there are light sources that are visible in the field of view, they're likely going to saturate our image sensor. And so that means that their intensity and their, uh, their full uh, color are going to be not correctly represented in our single exposure. And again, that's because we just have limited dynamic range of the sensor. So then our question really boils down to, how do we get high dynamic range 360 lighting from a single exposure image that has a limited field of view. Now, because so little information is actually available, our problem is massively under constrained. So it's, again, as I said, a good solution for a candidate, uh, or it's a good candidate for a solution via machine learning. Uh, so fortunately, some other folks have tried a similar kind of thing. There's some previous academic work uh, where a deep learning approach is is employed to try to get uh, high dynamic range lighting from a limited field of view indoor image. Um, this method can work well in some cases. There are a few limitations that we'll seek to, uh, to you know, improve upon. So I'm going to skip that for now. There's also um, an outdoor illumination technique where the idea is, OK, we're going to do this for an outdoor scene. And because in that case, you can look at just regressing to sky and sun model parameters, the problems like somewhat easier to solve, because you know, OK, there's going to be a sun. I'm just going to try to predict where's the sun in the scene, which is you're at least constraining the size of the search space there. Um, instead of requiring a large database of these high dynamic range panoramas, which in a typical deep learning kind of approach would be what you would think you would need, um, our team took a different approach for this. Um, what we do is that we design this custom mobile phone capture rig that I'm showing here. And this allows us to capture a large data set of cell phone videos that contain these three different spheres in the bottom portion of the image that tell us all we need to know about the lighting in the scene. Now, the mirror sphere is going to reflect high frequency lighting, but in a single exposure like the one that you see here, bright light sources like the sun will saturate the sensor, and so their full intensity won't be represented. The diffuse gray ball, in contrast, is going to reflect a blurred low frequency version of the lighting environment, but the correct overall intensity radiance of the scene will be measured correctly. And then this kind of Christmas ball, matte silver one, sort of splits the difference. And indeed, these are actually Christmas ornaments. So this entire rig is just 3D printed and some painted Christmas ornaments, so like less than $5 worth of materials. And the idea is that we can collect these training images um, where we can measure all of the lighting information in, in a wide variety of both indoor and outdoor scenes. So we actually walked around a lot of different Google campuses. I walked around some places in Playa Vista myself with this lighting rig, uh, capturing lots of lighting information here. And these are just some example videos from our training set. Um, in total, we end up with about 40 million lighting environments. So that's about the size of the data set that we're using for this machine learning problem. Now, once we've collected and then processed these videos, then we're ready to train our ML model. And the way this works is that we train an encoder-decoder style convolutional neural network um, to directly estimate the HDR lighting from our training images. And the way that we do this is we actually photograph what's called a reflectance field um, of the three spheres ahead of time. 
And this is the appearance of each one of the spheres when lit by a small cone of the lighting environment in the scene. And we do this in practice using a light stage system that's similar to the kind used for high resolution facial scanning. So once we have that information, uh, we're able to actually render inside the neural network the appearance of the sphere lit, lit by the predicted illumination. And we can compare that with the ground truth. And then this creates kind of an image reconstruction loss where we're just trying to correctly predict the lighting that would cause these three spheres to look this particular way. Uh, on top of this, we also add what's called an adversarial loss term. And the way that we can think of this is while we're training this main neural network for the lighting prediction task, we're also going to train a second network whose job it is is to just tell whether the mirror balls that we generate by the network are real or fake. And this additional network helps us be able to predict mirror balls that are real looking or that look like the kind that we've collected in our data set. So this means that the high frequency information that we get from the lighting is essentially hallucinated by this discriminator based training. At this point, we're ready to see some results and then I'll talk about how we've used it in a product. So this is a couple of indoor scenes. So this is all we have as input to our model. Um, there's some, some are indoor, here's some outdoor ones. Uh, on the top row, this is the ground truth. So this is the appearance of the spheres in the videos that we collect with the cell phone. And on the bottom are spheres that are rendered using our inferred lighting. So the bottom ones are lit using the result that comes out of the machine learning model. So the only input is the single cell phone image, which is only 6% of the lighting directions in the scene. And yet we're able to produce these kinds of results. Then here, uh, this is the ground truth for the outdoor scenes. And now for the, this is the prediction that comes out of our model. So again, one model, indoor and outdoor, we've made no assumptions about the kind of light that's in the scene. Um, so let's look now at comparison with previous state of the art. Some input scenes here, uh, ground truth. So these are the ones that were actually captured in the video. Uh, spheres that are rendered using our prediction. And uh, this is the previous academic state of the art, which we've uh, clearly done much better in this particular case. Um, for outdoor scenes, we're also doing better than the state of the art. So here's some different outdoor scenes, different times of day, shade, sun, all different scenes here. Uh, ground truth, so these are actually captured in our training data. This is our result. Uh, and then this is the previous state of the art. Uh, you can see the limitation there of only predicting the location of the sun. So that's the, the big uh, benefit for our approach. Um, so we also want to try to see, okay, we're, we're measuring this or we're trying to predict this lighting just so we can do better composites for AR. So let's actually look at some compositing results rather than just rendering these spheres. Um, so to do this, we uh, built this validation rig that allows us to capture both the background image uh, the ground truth light probe like you would use for visual effects, um, and then a color calibration target as well. And then at that, with this approach, what we're able to do is take our input image, take a photograph of a real object. So here this bunny is actually a 3D print of a real object that's painted. It's not a virtual object. But because we also have a 3D model for this particular object, we can also render it using the ground truth illumination that we actually measured in the scene with the classical technique. And then we can compare it to the lighting that's used to render that same virtual object with our technique and then with the previous state of the art. So this is kind of our validation test here. We can also switch the reflectance properties of the bunny to a shinier silver bunny. You can see that we're doing fairly well here. There is still some room for improvement though. They don't exactly match up. What we're trying to compare here is the hours versus the ground truth, right? Um, and these have all been offline renders at this point. So these were global illumination renderers. We said from the beginning, hey, we want to use this in AR. So let's actually talk about how do you then port this to augmented reality to make it available for developers. So since the acceptance of our academic publication, um, which all of the previous work has been about, we've actually also um, been working on making this available to developers through Google's AR Core platform, which is their toolkit um, or SDK for augmented reality developers. So this is actually shipping as a product. Uh, it was released, the first version of it was released in AR Core 1.10, which came out in June. 
Um, and so I'm going to show now some slides that show screenshots within an app that's built in Unity that's running on top of our new lighting SDK. So here are real-time renderings of a virtual rocket ship. These are captured on a Pixel 3 from uh, an Android phone from Google. And so these are just screenshots. And here the lighting looks generally believable, but we still do have some work to do. Um, for this second shot in particular, the shadow direction here is being determined by the neural network. Um, but as of right now, our API doesn't actually calculate the shadow ratio, which is why it doesn't quite look as dark as the real shadow in the scene. So again, we have some opportunities for improvement. We can look at the rocket in a few different environments now. So here are some different indoor and outdoor scenes. You can see realistic reflections. Um, I want to kind of point out that from a, a, an audience with a visual effects background, this probably wouldn't be acceptable uh, for, you know, for a feature film. But for, for augmented reality applications, this is leaps and bounds above what was previously possible before, which was what I showed in the beginning on the Pokemon, where you just have to assume a single light source from above because you don't have any other better information in the scene. So here's a few more, some different scenes here. And then finally, we want to see this in video running in real time on a phone. So this one is some different scenes indoor and outdoor. Uh, so this one has like a mixed shade and sun environment here. I placed it next to that trash can, which has a similar kind of silver reflectance. And then here's next to a window. You can see the lighting direction correctly figured out there, casting the shadow. This one's in direct sunlight again, next to the trash can. And then finally, this one's actually taken at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies. I just finished my PhD there, so. <laughs> and yeah, so this is the result that we have running in real time on the phone. And this is all built on top of the public-facing API that's available to developers. So just the contributions of this work. Um, we have a neural network-based approach to estimate high dynamic range 360 lighting from a limited field of view image. Um, our work's inspired by the desire to bring high-quality HDR image-based lighting to real-time mobile AR. Our model's trained using only low dynamic range input imagery that we captured on a rig that we built with $5 of material. Uh, and our approach outperforms the previous academic state of the art. And we're very excited because we've released it to developers. So that's, uh, that's I'm going to wrap up the talk. <laughs>